everyone, it's my great honor to introduce you to our next MC, who will be taking it over from uh, here on for the rest of the afternoon. And um, right before a very, very important uh, panel that's coming together. So Dr. Dave Hepburn um, is an award-winning syndicated columnist featured in several major newspapers across the United States and Canada and is a recipient of the prestigious Canadian Community Newspaper Associ Associ Association Columnist of the Year Award. He was the co-host of the show Biologic on the Oprah Winfrey Network, and his interest in sports and sport medicine resulted in him being called to be a medical director of the 1994 Commonwealth Games and a team physician for Canada in the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. Amongst the growing number of medical media physicians educated about um, ca uh, cannabis medicine. He's an active member of Society of Cannabis Clinicians, International Association for Cam Cannabinoid, Cannabinoid Medicine, the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, and Physician for Medical Cannabis. Um, I will pass it on uh, here to Dr. Dave Hepburn, and he's incredible. He um, also brings in the gift of um, medicine and laughter, and so you guys will really enjoy it. But this panel especially is really important as we go forward with legalization in Canada. Um, we have representation from every side here. We have LP representation, dispensary representation. Um, middle uh, size growing, small size growing, as well as industry. Um, as uh, I think the gentleman mentioned, Ca Canada is a pioneer in legalization and not only are other um, provinces looking to us as ambassadorship and as leadership, but so are other countries um, as hopefully cannabis legalization um, goes across the globe. So thank you so much. Help me in welcoming Dr. Dave Hepburn. All right, my job up here today is to introduce the moderator, who will in turn introduce the panel, who will introduce their topic, whatever it is, which you will take home the information, which you will introduce to your uncle, who may introduce you to the front door, which means you'll be introduced to the outside of BC outdoors, which means you may be introduced to a grizzly bear attack, which would lead you possibly be introduced to the emergency room physician, who in turn will introduce you to an opiate, which may prematurely introduce you to the Grim Reaper and introduce you to the pearly gates and you'll know you're in heaven when you pass St. Peter and he opens the gate and there is a field of total heavenly clouds, also known as THC, you're in heaven. Welcome back. All right, so I'm gonna introduce our moderator, Hillary Black. Now, I have to say that she moderated me a few months ago, and I have never been moderated so well in my life. I was so happy when I left that tremendous moderation. I went home, I had a smile on my face for two weeks, I had to go see a doctor and get a depressant. That's how well she did, and a few shots as well. Hillary, thanks for that as well. But I'm just gonna read what it says here about her. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so Hillary is currently the Director of Patient and Community Services for Bedrucan, which is an LP in Canada whose motto is, the only thing more important than our clients is somebody else's clients. Something, no, that's not yours. Uh, she provides education to patients and physicians, not that doctors ever need to be educated, of course. She also pioneered the very first medical cannabis dispensary in Canada. That's the BC Compassion Club Society, or BCCCS, or BS for short, I guess. Just keep bringing it down. That was back in 1936. But as an active user of cannabis, you can see what it does to the age the process. It's wonderful here. Now, she's also the recipient of the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Award, acknowledging her 
for making a significant contribution to Canadian society for her work with medical cannabis. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, she boycotted that particular awards ceremony when she found out that there were no actual diamonds involved or precious gems and that Queen Elizabeth was too busy off queening to even attend. So I'm going to turn it over to Hillary, uh, and she admits, of course, that cannabis is not the answer to everything. And in fact, after reading some of the negative side effects of THC, she gave up reading altogether. Yours. Thank you, Dave. Hi, it's wonderful to be here. Um, we had a lot to talk about. They sort of asked us to talk about dispensaries and small-scale growing, and in our conversation together, we decided that we wanted to focus on small-scale growers and what it was going to look like to try to have them included in future regulation. So we decided to focus this conversation. How many of you are interested in actively working to ensure that small-scale growers are included in future regulations? Okay, excellent. So, what we have here on this panel are some of the thought leaders and some of the people whose current work is committed 100% of the time to ensuring that, that that happens. We also have two people here from different parts of the supply chain, both from the dispensary world and the licensed producer world. And everybody on this panel agrees that that's a very important thing that we need to see happen in the future regulation, so we're not here to debate it. What we want to do today is share with you these brilliant brains to give you some of their key messages and strategies so that as the submissions go in to the government in the next couple of months, they can hear a number of the same recommendations from a variety of stakeholders because that's our understanding of how we move the needle. So get out your pens if you're actually going to be writing submissions and recommendations because these people have some amazing ideas. So rather than me introducing them, I would rather that you hear from them. So one at a time, I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and their work, and then we're going to launch into the issues. Starting with you, Andrew. Sure. Oh, with Andrew? Oh, Ian, sorry. No, no problem. Uh, my name is Ian Dawkins, and I am the executive director of the Cannabis Growers of Canada. Uh, we are a member-based trade association that represents uh, the entirety of the cannabis economy, from growers to value-added processors, extractors, bakers, etc., to the end retail point, be it online or in, in physical retail dispensaries. Um, my own background is as a, a lobbyist and a, a government relations person. I've worked for trade associations my whole career. Uh, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business is a small business lobbyist and, and policy analyst. Uh, I've worked as a government regulator here in British Columbia. Um, so my background is, is uh, as a professional, is, is government relations and, and explaining complicated issues about how small business works. And so there was a, a real natural fit to come over to the CGC and do the same thing on behalf of an emerging sector, which is frankly no different than any other small farming business uh, when you really get down to it. So. Um, our, our focus at CGC is representing the small and medium-sized independent sector. We currently have about 200 members across Canada and we're growing quick, quite rapidly and um, happy to, to provide some input into, into what our members do. I mean, that's what we do all day long at the CGC is meet with politicians and, and stakeholders and explain who small cannabis businesses are. So. Thank you. Andrew. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Robinson. I'm representing the Cannabis Trade Alliance of Canada. I'm filling in for Executive Director Rosie Mondin. Um, at CTAC, we have three pillars. Um, just to get it a little bit into it and then a bit into my background, with CTAC, we believe in inclusive growth is one of the pillars that we truly believe in, sustainability as well as transparency. Um, I've been in the cannabis space for about 15 years. I got involved in the MMAR early days, working with patients as well as eventually becoming a licensed grower, a designated grower, and working in the Okanagan area. Um, and that's led us to many different hurdles to overcome. We represent that small to medium size grower. And um, we're here to share some of the information and stuff that we, we put together in a policy paper over the last few months. Thank you. Teresa. Hi, my name is Teresa Taylor. Uh, I'm a farmer's daughter. I'm a second generation uh, cannabis advocate and I've grown up around cannabis all my life. Um, I also am a founding member of the Canadian Cannabis Coalition as well as the Marijuana Party of Canada. 
And I ran against Stockwell Day at the age of 24, which was a whole lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and I'm here today representing the Craft Cannabis Association of British Columbia. And uh, we've just recently launched a campaign, um, a, a craft cannabis campaign that educates and informs consumers and helps them recognize that when they go out and purchase cannabis, they are supporting small communities and, uh, and growers like my dad. Thank you. Dieter. Two mics. Choices. Um, my name is Dieter McPherson. Um, I've been in the cannabis space now for about 13 years. I started out in the production side, so outdoor growing, and I did that for many years. Um, I transitioned into the dispensary side of the industry about five and a half years ago at the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club and helped transition it to a nonprofit. Um, I currently sit as the president of the Canadian Association of Medical Cannabis Dispensaries, which is the oldest industry association representing dispensaries in the country. Uh, we have a very comprehensive set of standards and certifications, and we've been working uh, extensively with municipalities across this country uh, on land use and licensing of those dispensaries. Um, I also have a cannabis technology company called Canlio, uh, and we have a, a, a one of the first of its kind, a, a health licensed uh, production facility in the city of Victoria for uh, extra derivatives, cookies and things of that nature. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Neil Balat. Um, I'm the former executive director of the Canadian Medical Cannabis Industry Association, uh, now known as Cannabis Canada. It's the trade association for licensed producers. Um, after I left the association about 11 months ago, I joined Aurora, which uh, I like to think of as the people's LP. And we're, I think, the most culture community minded licensed producer in the country. And uh, you know, happy to be here today and, and share some of our thoughts on the future of the industry. Thank you. That's your panel. So, Neil, we're actually going to start with you. You know, there is, a, I think, a very widespread belief that all licensed producers want to keep all small scale growers out of the future marketplace. So why would a licensed producer support small-scale growers being included in the regulatory framework? Sure. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, well, I think, I think it's really important for a number of reasons. Um, you know, first of all, from kind of Aurora's standpoint, we stand behind the, uh, the quality of our product, our customer service, convenience, and that sort of thing. So we don't feel threatened by, by other participants. I think the market's big enough for, uh, to include small-scale growers and, and many other parts uh, of the industry at, at all levels. Um, you know, at Aurora, we've, we've always sort of had that mindset and the, the roots of our company are, are uh, people who come from the dispensary world and from the, uh, from the MMAR, for example. So I think a, a very healthy, competitive uh, future cannabis economy should, should include those people who, who've had a passion over the years and have, have sort of, um, you know, put their, put their liberty on the line to help people uh, gain access to medical cannabis and now gain access to uh, adult use cannabis. Thank you. Um, Ian, can you tell us a little bit about how small scale growers will fuel innovation and why that's important for a healthy industry? Can I ever? Um, it's a very similar economic case to anything else you make when you talk about small business versus big business. Um, you see it in technology, you see it in uh, a variety of other sectors. The small, a lot of churn, a lot of small startups, a lot of little companies battling out for market share, developing unique strains, coming up with new extraction methods is where you're going to see all of the IP come. It's, it's always been that way and it always will be that way. Um, is when you're talking about something as complicated as plant genetics and phenotypes, you need a shotgun approach because what you're, what you're hoping for is that one of these mad geniuses is going to come up with the, with the next Charlotte's Web, the next whatever that's going to create value not only for patients in the sense that we're targeting certain cannabinoids that we want to see or whatever, but economic benefits as well. You know, I mean, uh, how much money has Burner made off of Girl Scout cookies over the years, right? So uh, that's where all of the economic advantages that are going to rain down on society are going to come from. It's going to come from the churn of the small growers. Some of those will become big growers through success and through branding. Some of those small growers will develop a million dollar plant and sell it to a big licensed producer and move on. Some of them will go out of business because their, their cannabis is no good and that will be the churn. Um, I think that's where you're going to get all of the interesting intellectual property and all of the innovation out of. 
Thank you. Andrew, would you like to add something? Yeah, just um, well said, Ian. Um, at SeaTac, we truly believe in that craft cannabis movement. There's a wide variety of current stakeholders that participate in this cannabis industry currently, um, both illicit and, and illicit. Um, to be successful, we feel that you, we need to have them included. It's very important that the small to medium-sized growers, producers, extractors, lotion makers are involved in this industry in order to have a successful future of this cannabis industry. Thank you. Um, so that's innovation in terms of one of your like key messages for your submissions to the government is why small-scale growers, how small-scale growers are going to fuel in innovation and why that's important to the future of a healthy industry. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about the economics. And in our conversation that we had before this panel, preparing for it, we talked a lot about the fact that this will mean, especially for British Columbia, the difference between economic development and economic devastation for a lot of our community out here. So I'm going to turn to Dieter, and I'm wondering if you, could we, if you could first speak a little bit to the potential for economic development in, in, with including small-scale growers. Sure. Um, I, I think everybody here is probably aware that BC has a very entrenched and long-standing cannabis industry, and it's considered craft or small-scale. Uh, it's important to note that in, in Canada and in standard economics, a small business is anything less than 250 employees. Um, so we have a, a dearth of small-scale producers across this province. Um, cannabis is a commodity and it's a market that uh, can be developed very successfully, but we, we may have a major issue where we have an economic driving force in this province and many others that's been around for many years. Uh, and those small businesses and small-scale economies are a much uh, greater driver of economic growth and development than large agribusinesses. Um, so economic development comes from innovation and competition, and those are largely driven by, uh, as other people have said, those small businesses. Uh, it's estimated that it's between a two and a seven billion dollar industry as it stands already, and it's likely much larger when you consider all the secondary uh, knock-on benefits. Um, so legalization uh, at a provincial level and at a federal level needs to take into account the pre-existing economic realities. Uh, it's there, it supports many small communities, and it, it already directly injects that money into those local communities because it's considered disposable income. Taxation, other stuff needs to be taken into account, and we need to bring that into the light and find a way to structure it, but if they're not given a chance to be become part of that economic driving force in the new legalization framework, uh, BC and other provinces stand to lose dearly. Thank you. So, Teresa, you come from a small community that has a rich history of cannabis cultivation, including your dad. Her dad, Brian Taylor, like 20 years ago, planted the word hemp in hemp across the side of a hill in their small town. And then we got, did it get burnt down? Oh, it had to get ripped out. It had to get ripped yeah, out. And yeah. he was the mayor when he did that? Uh, it was right before he was elected and yeah. then crowned and was elected. So, yeah. Shocking. So, um, but, so, so talk to us a little bit about what your concerns are around the economic health of your community if small-scale growers aren't included in future regulations. Well, I, in a small town like mine, I, th I think there's a lot of people that supplement their income with cannabis growing. So there's a number of businesses in our community um, that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that supplementary income. So it, the devastation would extend... Uh, beyond just just people losing their income from exclusively cannabis cultivation, um, these are little you know bookshops and coffee shops and those sorts of things where people have a bit of a side project going on that helps them stay afloat in tiny little towns. So I think that's important in a, a very important piece to um, recognize. Um, the other the other part that I would like to see is a transition. When we had a downturn in forestry, uh, we put a lot of money in helping people get retraining and move into a, a new industry, and I think it's it's vital. Um, that we supplement and we put money into helping people start up cannabis businesses and transition um, their existing businesses into something legitimate if that's what they need. I think that there's people that could use some extra support and I think if our government really cared about transitioning um, that that would be something they would consider doing to help our small communities.
go ahead. Oh, yeah, I just really wanted to add uh, really quickly that um, to, to both Dieter and Teresa's points, um, at CGC, you know, we were, we've were we been talking to politicians about the, the anecdotal kind of cash economy in British Columbia that we all know exists. You know, you go to Port Hardy or wherever, it, that's the major employment, especially for young people. But we wanted to actually put some numbers around it. So we hired an economist and kind of plugged in some basic sort of assumptions. You know, the, the government of Canada assumes this much cannabis is produced in British Columbia. If you talk to most growers, this is how many man hours it takes to tear down a plant, you know, and trim it and process it. Therefore, what do you get? And the end result is something between 40 and 50,000 cannabis trimming jobs, FTEs in British Columbia alone. That's just trimming. Uh, that doesn't take into account any of the other things. So when you put it all together, you're looking at probably six-figure jobs across Canada, you know, 100, 150,000 jobs. And that, if you're, again, if you're meeting with politicians, that's the message you need to take to them, is that there is no way that you can displace $5 billion of economic activity from British Columbia to Ontario without it destroying this country. This is just too many jobs. It's not even a matter of morals or ethics, it's economics. You can't move that much stuff from one province to another and not have it result in Teresa's entire community being blown apart and many others. So that's the message that we all share here and, and that you guys need to take to whoever you talk to. Andrew, yeah, I just wanted to add to Dieter, Teresa, and Ian's point, um, including the farming sector. With, within this cannabis space, we're able to start applying for environmental farm plan programs. It should be looked after under agricultural environmental initiatives as well. Um, the way, in, the, in the large LPs, at the, well, most of the LPs, the higher levels of the LPs of these big companies are mostly men. I mean, I'm one of the you know one of the women that has a job in one of these licensed producers. It's not that's uh, sort of in the higher levels of the company, but it's not very uh, common. Um, Teresa, I'm wondering if you can comment on how you think it might affect women in the cannabis industry if we include smaller businesses. Well, I think, I, I think that that will sort of, uh, I want to say trickle up, but what they're seeing right now in the United States is that there are a higher number of women CEOs in positions, in, in high-level positions in cannabis than there is in any other industry. Um, and so I think the, the way that women start into that is through, through their own exploration, their own small business. But um, it's, a, it's a very, I want to say, a comfortable place for women to begin. Um, herbalism and, and the study of plants is something that's very much in our domain and it, it, it's sort of deep rooted and so um, it's an industry that calls to women. And so we have a great opportunity um, to build up some equality uh, economically through entering into this, into this space. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, half of our members are women for sure. And that's something that is important to preserve as we move forward. I mean, the fact that cannabis entrepreneurship is accessible to women and minorities who don't have a lot of money to start an LP is something that we need to defend to the to very last because this is a last stage economic opportunity for young people at a time when the economy is not doing so hot. Aren't they great? This is such a smarty pants group of people. They've been really um, working hard on this issue for a long time. So those are our first two key messages. The first one is about innovation and the health of the future industry. The second one is economic development versus economic devastation. And now, you know, a lot of the language that we're hearing coming out of the government right now is about keeping marijuana and cannabis out of the hands of the criminals. And that's us, you know. So, one of the things that I'm really interested in moving the needle with the perception of the government as they create these regulations is rather than perceiving those with experience and expertise as the criminals, uh, really seeing the benefit of including us in the future regulations. Um, uh, so if you had the opportunity to speak to the task force, for example, um, what's something that you would want to tell them to change the perception of the cannabis community that we are not the criminals? Well, I think outside from engaging in, in um, cannabis economics, uh, there's less than 5% that have any association to organized crime. And I think that's important to note um, that it's our activity in, in, in cannabis that, that is the illegal activity. But beyond that, we're law-abiding citizens. 
Dieter? Sure. Um, that, that, that's a really good point. By and large, people in the cannabis space uh, are breaking one law and one law alone, and that is a bad law, and that's why we're changing it. Um, so the government of Canada, Canada stated policy goals of keeping it out of the hands of children and, and not enriching organized crime will not be achieved by uh, not allowing the existing market to participate. Um, you, you, you can't expect that this industry would be able to transition overnight. It's something that's going to take a long time. But if we look at other jurisdictions that have gone into the legalization market, like in the United States, they've uh, attempted where possible to integrate those that were pre-existing in the business and were breaking an unjust law because they bring a lot of experience. Uh, not only that, but if you encourage them to integrate, then they become part of a program where you can track the finances, there's more oversight, uh, concerns about, well, is this going to quote unquote gun runners, which is absolute hogwash from our uh, liberal government. I can't believe they're using that language. Um, you can bring them into the fold and then when it becomes part of a regulated market, those concerns disappear. Now, if if they, uh, through regulatory burden, make it so that people cannot participate in their new legal market because they were operating before, it'll actually create a thriving black market that will continue to, to move along as it always has. This is a, a, an economic powerhouse. Uh, you can't expect people to all of a sudden pull up roots and, and find a new job. That's a horrible pun, I'm sorry. So it, there, there's serious concerns that if they, th this is their stated policy goals, they need to realize that they have to include as much as possible the existing market, otherwise it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. We'll, we'll have a thriving black market that will compete against the legal market, and we've seen this in other industries like alcohol and tobacco as well, if it's overregulated, overtaxed, and it's not accessible. Uh, people already consume it, whether it's legal or not. I think it would also be nice to, to have um, sort of the task force and others acknowledge uh, that certain people in, in certain communities in Canada have been uh, disproportionately harmed by prohibition. And I think it's, you know, they should be looking at it a little bit of an angle, including job legitimization as well as job creation and, and giving an opportunity for people who have been disproportionately harmed to participate in the new cannabis economy. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, it, when we talk about having the Governor General stand up in the House of Commons and say this government intends to legalize cannabis and then refuse to decriminalize, uh, all it takes is a basic understanding of statistics to know that that's an, it's an inherently racist thing to do because more minorities, more disadvantaged people are going to be arrested for cannabis possession over the next year, 18 months, than it is going to be people that look like me. I guarantee you that. So it, it's, it's just a fundamental irresponsible thing to do to create this black hole for all of us to live in and if the government wants to be serious about doing this properly they need to back off of the, of the criminal prosecutions and actually let us sort this mess out for them. Thank you. I would add just to show the task force what the cannabis community looks like. It's all of us in this room, it's, it's your peers, your neighbors, your sisters, your brothers, not the idea that they have, not the stigmas. Show that task force that we're law-abiding citizens, other than this rule that they, that we're... <laughs> Only break one law at a time. <laughs> yeah. It's kept me out of a lot of trouble, I think. <laughs> so any last comments before we take questions? Great. So let me see again a show of hands of how many of you are actually gonna make the effort to make a submission uh, on this issue. Thank you. Excellent. Good. And did you find some of the material that we covered today? It's a lot of material to do in a very short amount of time, but it's kind of reflective of how much time we have to get our submissions into the task force. It's all happening, uh, you know, rapid speed. Um, I hope you got some useful information. Feel free to come and chat with these people. They have so much more knowledge in their head on this issue than we were able to get into today. And now we have a few minutes for questions and answers. Are you going to MC the Q&A? Great. I got a real quick and simple question for you. Can you be specific about what we all can do? I've been a lobbyist dealing with, with David and Goliath issues for a long time, and one thing that always surprises me that people underestimate is the value of either walking down to your local constituency office or writing a non-form letter. Either one of those, or a phone call. Any personal contact to your local MP or MLA is like a nuclear bomb going off on their day. If they get five in-person phone call letters on a single issue, five is a big number to your member of parliament. A hundred is a four alarm tire fire for them. That's the worst day they've ever had. So do not underestimate your power to go down to your local MP and give them a piece of your mind. That's what we need to do. 
on the questions, as you line up here, make sure they're questions and not comments. And just we'll just have you, the criminals line up all the way through here. And uh, <laughs> one question each, all right? Let's go ahead. Thank you. Um, intellectual property from a uh, democratic standpoint with uh, Commonwealth cannabis, heirloom strains that were preserved through generations through uh, uh, farmers in Asia that were then brought in the 70s through um, smugglers that were then hybridized over the last 30, 40 years, indica sativa hybrids, mm -hmm. that are now looking for IP mm -hmm. to protect that labor. Has to, that model has to take into account the fact that cannabis heirloom genetics, these land race strains mm -hmm. that were cultivated over the centuries, mm -hmm. required a kind of a total approach. And I just want to put that idea out there in, as we're doing this sort of people's approach to democratization of craft. So there's a craft there too. And I think uh, we want to think about ways to create uh, public gene bank, mm -hmm. seed banks and uh, ways to uh, acknowledge ourselves in that way rather than okay, you're growing this strain that I kind of put together, let me go and shut you down mm -hmm. wherever you are. Okay. So. You, you have a question at all for the panel or just that? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. Okay, <laughs> cell block C for that guy. Uh, so keep it to a question and uh, anybody wants to comment on that? Uh, we, we've actually already run into this. There is, uh, in Canada, there's groups that have been patenting specific genetic, uh, not genetics, but plant characteristics. Phenotypes. Um, the, the question needs to come out there, though, because we've seen this before in other industries where large agribusiness will come in, will stake claim to something that's been in the public domain for a long time and then try and corner it. Uh, I think in this case, the genie's uh, efficiently out of the bottle, so it'd be really hard for them to do, but it's something we should watch for. But we also have to allow for some level of uh, protection of, of IP, but it, it obviously is not going to be the genetics that are out there. They're, they're everywhere. They can't put it back in the bottle, personally. Okay. Um, it's a similar question to the first one about what can we do. I feel I'm part of the general population in Canada, and there's really no information going out to the general population of this country mm -hmm. about what's going on. People that I talk to have no idea. Mm -hmm. And so I'm willing to put in time. I'm retired. I have time. Use me. Um, but how do I connect, other than a conference, to groups mm -hmm. if I'm not part of the so-called cannabis culture? Mm -hmm. I'm interested in medicinal. Um, and for my generation, I think we are the former hippies. Um, we should be open <laughs> to, to really supporting these issues for legalization. Um, so I'm just saying, I've done searching on the internet, my son helps me, but um, well, people I, don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. So how that's, do we reach them? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a, a great first step is to search online and also within your local community. Actually, I would suggest going to a local dispensary Absolutely. Um, and, and talking with the people there and, and getting an idea about what, what it is that they're doing and what, where they could use some... Go ahead. I'm talking more about general population, how mm -hmm. we're going to reach them. They're not going to go to a dispensary. I want to see more in the media. Mm -hmm. um, I think the cannabis culture needs to be broadening their outlook on this education. Well, Craft, Craft Cannabis, if you go to craftcannabis.ca, we recently released a, a video that compared um, beer and the evolution of beer uh, post-prohibition to that of cannabis and how for a long time um, the industry was dominated by a select number of producers and how long it took before smaller producers could come onto the scene. Um, so it's a good message to share with people who are outside of the cannabis bubble to show them that comparison between um, the history of beer and, and that of what's happening to cannabis. Uh, to, to your point though, I think you're right that there is a really a bad information vacuum right now on this issue and I think that it's important for the general public to remember that less than a year ago the idea of cannabis being legalized in Canada was a pipe dream and that this fell from outer space. I mean this was a uh, your politics aside, I'm sure Andrew's going to poke me under the table, but I don't think anyone expected the Liberal government to win when they first began that campaign. And frankly, the fact that at the end of the day, now cannabis has been going to be legalized is sort of something that we're all struggling with how to deal with. I talk all day long to reporters, and I'm trying to explain to them what we do. And so I think that what you're going to see over the summer in particular is a lot more stories by some of the major media outlets where they're actually approaching cannabis as a craft business opportunity, an investment opportunity, a growth opportunity, an employment opportunity, and not all of this, you know, 
the, the traditional nonsense that we've had to deal with, the reefer madness stuff. So we're finally getting there, but you have to remember, we're, we're starting from nothing with no resources, no organization. This just fell out of outer space, and we're all just trying to get this stuff going as fast as possible. So uh, the best thing, to, to, her, to Teresa's point, the best thing you, that you, you as an individual can do is to link up with your local cannabis businesses, not the activist community, the businesses, and find out what's it like going through the variance process. Do you need me to go to the city when they have their public input session? Do you need me to speak on your behalf? That's what you can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. <laughs> criminal or hippie? <laughs> this is just criminals. Hippies are over there by the Volkswagen bus. Okay. I'm wearing a blazer, so no. Oh, blazer. Okay, good. Uh, hi. I just have a quick question. I'm not uh, involved in the culture as well yet, but I do have a question about um, dispensaries that are opening now uh, while this process uh, continues. Is there any sort of like, uh, I'm a former Bikram yoga instructor, and so when you would open a studio nearby another person's studio, you'd actually have to call them up and be like, hey, dude, I'm opening a studio, whether you like it or not. But it's a common courtesy is to sort of keep the um, open line of communication. Do you guys have any sort of uh, information or um, ideas or philosophies as to how we can order, sort of get along while opening these dispensaries at the same time? Do you have three hours? There's someone on this panel that Maybe. might be able to help, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can opt it. Well, we both could. Um, so Do you know what I mean? Like, even the phone call. Like, yeah, is anybody doing that? Oh, of course they are. Yeah, so the okay. oldest of Some. the dispensaries operated for 20 years based on the good grace of their local communities. It was a much different time, and they faced serious pressure from police, often very, very frequent raids. So this, was a, this has been a battle of public perception and public support. If we didn't have that social license, quote unquote, we wouldn't be where we are today. Now we do run the risk of what's called the tipping point where uh, the economic driving forces sort of overtake what was the original ideals of an activist movement. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but what it means is there's a different driving force behind the opening of these dispensaries. And that's not a bad thing, but it's still illegal. And, and this is a complaints-based industry. So uh, there are a lot of tensions that, uh, between local communities and these businesses that operate. But I think a lot of that is, is largely due to old uh, ideas and preconceived notions around cannabis itself. Um, the idea that it needs to be treated like a major criminal product that harms lots of people, which it doesn't. So uh, there's, a, there's a fine line between those two, and that's partially because of a lack of regulation. So there's no governing body, uh, there's governing bodies that try, like uh, Camp City and others. Uh, but until we have a clear set of standards, then of course it's going to be up to each individual operator to decide what's best. Now, Camp CD has a clear set of standards, and we put those out there, and they've been around for quite some time, that encourage being strong stewards of their local communities. Um, but you're always going to have bad apples when there's hundreds and hundreds of operators. Unfortunately, that's just a truism. Most of them would have gone out of business on their own if the cities hadn't started getting involved. I mean, most of the bad actor dispensaries, when we talk about, oh, it was over 150 in Vancouver, it's over 200 in Toronto, half of those places were going out of business because they didn't know what the heck they were doing. So I don't know what the big rush was to, to get rid of them. They were going out of business on their own. When is the dispensary panel? Uh, oh, tomorrow? I'm not sure what time. I, th I think it's yeah. tomorrow. But we decided not to really jump into that issue because there is a group of great, well-informed people that are going to dive into some of the nuances around the dispensary. So you might want to show up for that panel as well. Um, thank you all. You've been a really captive, wonderful audience. I wish we had more time to dive into some of these details. But Hi, Larry, just, uh, just a yeah. quick question as you're coming to a close. But uh, can you speak a little bit about task force and what that's looking like from now until April 20th of last, next year? Uh, no, I actually can't. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I've been so focused on approaching this outside of the task force model that I've been leaving it to people like Andrew. So you know what, you, I think it's probably better off that you speak to the task force. Okay. The federal stuff is, I've been dealing with the province mostly. Sure, I can talk a little bit about the task force. So um, uh, it's important to remember that the, what they've stated for the spring of next year is just the tabling of the initial le uh, 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 legislation. So after that point, it has to go through the House, the Senate, back to the House, has to get royal assent. And that's only the first step. Um, most everyone agrees that this task force is purely working on the federal uh, legislation. And that's going to be a pretty small portion of what will be a provincial uh, movement. So the provinces are going to be doing probably 75% of the regulatory lift on this subject. Um, so we're looking at probably no sooner than 18 months to two years before we see the first legal gram sold. I could be wrong, but that's kind of the timeline we're looking at. 
but that's important because we have an election in this province, province coming up very soon. So others have asked about this. If you want to do something, make sure that this election, this is an issue that they have to talk about. Uh, the only government in the province that's sort of starting to talk about it is the NDP and the Liberals. The provincial Liberals haven't said anything. They're avoiding it. Unless we make it an issue where we as a province want to deal with this because we realize we have a stake in this, then it won't. They'll avoid it. So uh, we cannot wait for that task force because the election coming up exactly. is going to be more important to what legalization looks like in this province because they're the ones that are going to set uh, how it's sold, where it's sold, and how it's produced. And, uh, so, all right. Hang on, hang on. I just, one more I just wanted, to, I wanted to say on that that we do have some allies on a provincial level that view this as an agricultural crop. And I think that's important that this is not about drug production, this is about agriculture. And so uh, recognize that we've got some allies there in the province. Absolutely. If, if you were Stockwell Day, I was not going to let you say anything, but that's fine. So thank you, Hillary, and this very knowledgeable panel here. And how about a round of applause for all of you guys? That was great. British Columbia, home to the most beautiful landscapes in the world. Home to mom and pop vineyards, hot springs, farmers markets, some of the world's best skiing, snowboarding, surfing, and mountain biking. We protect our rainforests and keep our air clean. In BC, we strike the right balance between nature and nurture. But did you know that for the last 30 years, BC has also been home to the finest cannabis in the world? BC Bud is world renowned for its taste, aroma, and potency. We've competed and won cups, gained recognition from international celebrities. We are the Cannabis Growers of Canada. We create wealth, opportunity, and good paying private sector jobs. The BC cannabis crop is worth over $7 billion a year, and there were over 17,000 farms creating work for Canadians and improving the lives of millions of people. We are joining together to build a free and fair cannabis market that benefits all Canadians. Won't you come and join us at cannagrowers.ca?